Our central bank in Canada is called the Bank of Canada. So the Bank of Canada was established in 1934. This was after the Great Depression. And during the Great Depression, we saw bank runs. That is, people weren't sure that they could trust the banks, that the banks would have enough money that when they went to go get it, it would still be there. And so we created a central banking system to ensure that people could have confidence that their money would be available to them when they went to pull it out of the bank. So our Bank of Canada was created in 1934, and the Bank of Canada has five purposes. It is a banker to commercial banks. It is controller of the money supply, banker to the federal government, manager of the country's monetary policy, and supporter of the fiduciary monetary system. So we want to look at each one of these and what they mean. But first, who is the current governor of the Bank of Canada? So this video is being made in November of 2020. Uh, who is the current head of the Bank of Canada? Well, the current head of the Bank of Canada is a gentleman named Tiff Macklem. Okay. And uh, here's a picture here of Tiff Macklem. Now, the U.S., instead of a bank of the U.S., they have what is called the Federal Reserve. And there is a chairman of the Federal Reserve. That's what they call the leader of the U.S. Central Bank, whereas we have a governor of the Bank of Canada. But do you know the name of the head of the U.S. Federal Reserve? Well, as of November 2020, it is a gentleman named Jerome Powell. And a picture of Jerome Powell, okay, we can see here. So the U.S. monetary system is led by Jerome Powell, and the Canadian monetary system is led by Tiff Macklem. So what is it that these gentlemen do? Well, the Bank of Canada, as we said, has five purposes. So let's dive in and look at each one of these. The first is to be banker to commercial banks. And what we mean by that is we actually mean that they're banker to what we call chartered banks. So chartered banks are banks that exist because they have approval and they, have, they are overseen by the Bank of Canada. So when we talk about the Bank of Canada being banker to commercial banks, really we mean these chartered banks, okay? Now, if you are a chartered bank, then you can keep a fraction of your reserve or your money stored with the Bank of Canada. Now, the Bank of Canada can set the reserve requirement. This reserve requirement is the percentage or what fraction of that money has to be held at the Bank of Canada. So a bank has a certain amount of money, what percentage do they have to store with the Bank of Canada? Well, our reserve requirement in Canada is currently 0%. And I believe we talked about this in a previous video. So that means that these banks don't technically have to keep money at the Bank of Canada because it's 0%, although many of them choose to. Other countries can have higher reserve requirements, 10%, 20%, and so they are mandated to keep money with their central bank. The other thing that it means to be banker to these chartered banks is that the Bank of Canada is the lender of last resort. So that means these banks, like Royal Bank and CIBC, which are chartered banks, they can borrow money from the Bank of Canada. But the Bank of Canada would prefer that they borrow money first from another bank. So CIBC could borrow money from Royal Bank if they were short on cash. And if they aren't able to borrow money from the other bank, then they can come to the Bank of Canada for that. Now, in order to be the lender of last resort, there needs to be an incentive to come to the Bank of Canada last. So the Bank of Canada sets what is called the overnight target rate and the bank rate. So the overnight target rate 
is the rate at which banks can borrow from each other. And so the Bank of Canada sets a target for what this should be. And then, of course, the banks can negotiate. So it's a target. And the bank rate then is the rate at which CIBC or Royal Bank can borrow from the Bank of Canada. Well, if the Bank of Canada is to be the lender of last resort, then which of these numbers should be higher? Well, if you want Royal Bank to come to the Bank of Canada last, then the bank rate needs to be a higher rate. And in fact, the bank rate is always a quarter of a percent higher. So right now, November of 2020, the overnight target rate is 0.25%, and the bank rate therefore must be 0.5%, okay? So notice there's a quarter of a percent difference, there always is, and the bank rate will always be a quarter of a percent higher. Now we have considerably low interest rates right now. The overnight target and the bank rate are quite low. Why would we do this? Well, low interest rates, meaning the banks have access to money, encourages the banks to then loan you money. And so if we have greater access to loans, then people are more likely to spend and it helps stimulate the economy. By changing these rates, the Bank of Canada is controlling the money supply. So they're controlling how much access there is to the cash. If there, it's easy to get access to cash because these rates are so low, then banks are likely to borrow, individuals and businesses are likely to borrow, there's lots of money in circulation, lots more spending. Now, if you're in the middle of a recession, this is good, right? Because we're not spending, so we wanna get people spending. But if people are already spending and you lower the interest rate, so there's now, it's easy to get money, so now you're more likely to buy the house, buy the car, borrow more money, spend, 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 too much money in circulation creates inflation. And we know this because if this is demand and this is supply, if it's easy to get a hold of cash to spend, that demand is going to increase. And if we're looking at demand for all goods and services, aggregate demand and aggregate supply, then we know this raises the CPI and causes inflation. If there's too little money in circulation, so if it's hard to get a hold of cash, the challenge with this is that people then don't spend. And if businesses can't get a hold of enough cash, then it's hard to pay workers. And if you can't pay your workers, they're not gonna work. So too little money leads to unemployment. And there's a clip from the um, movie Ascent of Money in our uh, class here, where you can see what happens when there's too much money and too little money in circulation. So the job of the Bank of Canada is to find that spot in the middle where there's not too much money, that we have too much inflation, and not too little money that we can't buy goods, that we can't then make goods, pay workers, right? There's a whole circular flow. We need money to be flowing through. And if people aren't buying, businesses don't have money, they can't pay their workers, and then we get unemployment. So we gotta find that spot in between. Now it's, the Bank of Canada is the only institution in Canada allowed to print money. And we're gonna talk in our next video about how the Bank of Canada prints money. This can be creating um, physical money, minting coins, okay, printing banknotes. This can be quantitative easing. We're gonna talk about that in our next video, quantitative easing, where you're creating electronic money. So we're, the Bank of Canada decides how much money there is in circulation and how much it is circulating by changing that overnight target rate and that bank rate. Okay. Now, when it comes to controlling the money supply, oops, sorry, let's go back here. Um, don't need that one anymore. Don't need that one anymore. Is it possible to have negative interest rates? So what if we're trying to slow the economy down? When we try to slow the economy down, we raise the interest rates up. If we're trying to stimulate the economy, 
then we lower the interest rates. Well, we know already that our interest rates are quite low. So at some point, the challenge with monetary policy is, well, when you drop them really low, can you continue to put more money into circulation? Well, you can print more. We can have more quantitative easing. We can also lower the interest rates, even technically into the negative realm. And so this became a topic of discussion a couple of years ago, is should we be having negative interest rates? And so uh, the woman you see here in the picture, her name is Janet Yellen, and she was the uh, chair of the Federal Reserve before um, Jerome Powell. And we have seen negative interest rates. Japan has done it. Essentially what you are doing is you are charging banks money to sit on their cash. So what you're, instead of getting them to, you want to encourage them to get rid of it. You want to encourage them to lend it out. Uh, so a negative interest rate is essentially a fee for holding money uh, as opposed to, you know, making it cheap to borrow. So it is possible to have negative interest rates. Not a lot of countries have done it, um, but it, it is another way to um, get more money into circulation. Now, of course, if we're trying to make sure that there's not too much money or too little money, the challenge, of course, is when we print money or we use quantitative easing to create electronic money, when we want to slow the economy down to fight that inflation, we need to pull that money back out of the system. And so uh, the article that we see here, so again, here's a picture of Janet Yellen. So 2008 recession, lots of printing money, lots of quantitative easing, trying to stimulate the economy. Well, then the Federal Reserve is dumping tons of money, four trillion of it, <laughs> uh, into the economy to help stimulate it. Well, as the economy starts to grow, that amount of money is sitting in circulation and you have to pull it back. Otherwise, we have downward pressure on those interest rates. We have lots of money in circulation. And then when the next recession hits, the problem is, is you can't lower the interest rates even lower. You already have lots of cash sitting out there. Um, so during the good times, are you, are you pulling it back in? Are you raising the interest rates up? Are you pulling more of the money out of circulation so that when you're trying to stimulate the economy again, you have at your um, disposal monetary policy? One of the concerns is if interest rates stay too low all the time, then the problem becomes that when things get worse, there's nothing you can do with monetary policy because you're already in that realm. Essentially, the interest rates are so low, your only option is negative interest rates or dumping tons more money into circulation. All right, so we said the Bank of Canada is banker to commercial banks, controller of the money supply, and their third job is banker to the federal government. So the federal government, so when you pay your taxes to the federal government, they put that money in their checking account in the Bank of Canada. So the federal government keeps their money in the Bank of Canada. And when the government needs to borrow money, what it does is it issues bonds, and those bonds it sells to the Bank of Canada. The Bank of Canada gives them cash, okay, or electronic money or physical money, and the bond is an IOU. The Bank of Canada can then sell that bond to you as an investor. Uh, so you might have some uh, government savings bonds um, in your portfolio. And so that's why we, we count those government savings bonds as money uh, because they're coming from the Bank of Canada. So the Bank of Canada is a fiscal agent and fiscal just means having to do with the finances. So is a fiscal agent for the federal government. Now, the next purpose of the Bank of Canada is to be manager of the country's monetary policy. So we said before that they're controller of the money supply. They control how much money is in circulation. Well, tied to the amount of money in circulation, is monetary policy and using the amount of money in circulation changing that bank rate and overnight target rate uh, 
to help stimulate the economy and slow it down. Now, the way that it works in Canada is that the governor of the Bank of Canada is appointed for seven years. And the idea here is to give them a long enough term that they span more than one election. So ideally, the Bank of Canada is independent from the federal government. Now, there are pros and cons to being independent or dependent. You want the federal government and the Bank of Canada to be independent so that your federal government doesn't decide, you know what, we're just going to spend, 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 and the Bank of Canada is just going to give us tons and tons more cash, right? So the problem with this, of course, is the more money in circulation we know where to go leads to too much inflation. So by having them operate independent, it creates some accountability for the fiscal policy, the government spending, to not overspend by printing and borrowing money to create inflation. So the independence allows for that check. However, you also would like your federal government doing the fiscal policy, so spending in taxes, to be in alignment with the monetary policy. Because the last thing you want to do is have the government spend to stimulate the economy and have the Bank of Canada raise interest rates to slow down spending. You don't want them to work in opposite directions. You'd like them to work together to either both stimulate the economy or slow it down to fight inflation. So while they tend to operate independently, we do in Canada have the ability for the prime minister to fire the governor of the Bank of Canada. So if the prime minister disagrees with the governor of the Bank of Canada, the minister of finance can mandate that the Bank of Canada change its policies. Now, this has never happened in the history of Canada, but it is possible for the prime minister and the finance minister to essentially mandate what the Bank of Canada does. The U.S. has a system where... Where did it go? Has a system, same thing, where they operate independently. The Federal Reserve and the U.S. federal government operate independently. However, the president of the U.S. has influence over the appointment of the head of the Federal Reserve and the members of the Federal Reserve because it's a board. So that has led to a number of discussions as to... Is it better to have a more independent central bank? What happens if your central bank, your Federal Reserve, your Bank of Canada becomes more political? That is, they're trying to make the prime minister or the U.S. president happy rather than being dictated more by economic policy. So is it better to have an independent central bank? Or is it better for the central bank to be a part of the federal government? All right, so let's go back to our list. We have banker to commercial banks, controller of the money supply, banker to the federal government, manager of the country's monetary policy, so using those interest rates and printing money to stimulate or slow down the economy, and finally, we have supporter of the fiduciary monetary policy. Oh, sorry, I jumped ahead. Before we leave that, before we leave this one, let's look in a little bit more detail about that monetary policy, about changing those rates. So how does Canada, how does the Bank of Canada influence the, change the country's monetary policy? So we said before, the Bank of Canada sets the bank rate and the overnight target rate, right? They're always within a quarter of a percent of each other. Which one's higher? The bank rate. So you can see here over time, the bank rate and the overnight target rate so bank rate in green, overnight target rate in red, 
This one also shows the overnight lending rate. So that's what the banks are actually lending to each other at. Remember the Bank of Canada sets a target and then the banks can negotiate between themselves. So it's not always exactly the target, but you can see over the last uh, decade, we've been pretty close. Now, this is the rate at which the banks can get money. Then we have what is called the prime rate. The Bank of Canada does not set the prime rate. Banks like Royal Bank and CIBC, they set the prime rate. The Bank of Canada sets the bank rate and the overnight target rate. But what do you notice about the prime rate? So here's 96 to 2005. Let's zoom out and look at 2006 to the present. What do you notice about the prime rate? Notice that its movements match the movements of the overnight target rate and bank rate. And that's because the easier it is for your bank to get money, the easier it will be for you to get money. Okay, so we said as of fall or November 2020, the bank rate was 0.5%. The overnight target rate was 0.25%. What is the prime rate right now? Well, the prime rate as of November 2020 is 2.45%. So this difference between the bank rate and the prime rate is because of your credit additional risk to lend to a household or individual versus lending to a big bank. There's a bit of profit there for the banks, right? The difference between is the money that the bank is making. So think of this as their cost and then what they charge you, right? So of course they're going to charge you more than it costs them to borrow. But you can see that they tend to move together because as the cost to the bank changes, they're gonna pass that on to you as well. So the Bank of Canada sets the bank rate and the overnight target rate, they don't set the prime rate. But because changing the bank rate and the overnight target rate will change what banks charge you, this will then cause more borrowing or less borrowing by households and businesses. So when you borrow money for a car or a house, you're paying prime plus a percentage or prime minus a half, uh, depending on how risky you are, what kind of deal you get. But it's all based on this prime rate, which is based on the bank rate and overnight target rate. Sorry, so let's go back to the last purpose which is supporter of the fiduciary monetary system. So what do we mean supporter of the fiduciary monetary system? Well, the word fiduciary means holding in trust. So the purpose of the Bank of Canada is to create faith or trust that your money that you're holding today, that toonie, that loony, will be worth something in the future, will allow you to buy essentially the same things tomorrow that you bought today. So they're creating trust or confidence in our money and in the monetary system. So how do they do that? Well, they're there to prevent the run on the bank, right? So if your bank runs out of money, they can borrow money from another bank, overnight target rate, they can borrow money from the Bank of Canada, right? The bank rate. If a bank is insolvent, and we saw this in the 2008 recession, there were a number of banks in the US that kind of went under, right? <laughs> Essentially bankrupt. Uh, these banks, what happens then? Well, if your bank goes under, then in Canada, we have the Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation, the CDIC. So your money in your bank accounts are insured. So if your bank goes out of business, then you can recoup some of your lost money. This is a crown corporation. So that means that it's a business owned by the government. And in Canada, you are insured up to $100,000 per account. So if you have 500 grand in your bank account and your bank goes under, you will get hundred grand, okay? If you have $50,000 in your bank account and your bank goes under, you get 50,000. So up to $100,000 per account. 
So what do we learn from this? If you're gonna have more than $100,000, you should probably have it in multiple accounts. Now, the CDIC insures those chartered banks. However, banks that are not chartered banks, okay, so our near banks, right? We talked about um, like service credit union, other co-op co -op banks, provincial banks like um, the Alberta Treasury, um, what is the name of that bank? <laughs> uh, ATB. Those banks, they are not insured by the Bank of Canada, okay? ATB is insured by the province. However, banks like Service Credit Union can purchase insurance from CDIC or from the province. So it's not that they're not insured um, because in order to compete, they would need to have it. It's just that they're having to pay for it. Now, in comparison, in the U.S., there is the FDIC, okay, so the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. In the U.S., you are insured for $250,000 per person per bank. So it's not based on an account, it's based on individual per bank. So again, here, if you have more than $250,000, you're going to put it in different banks, okay? So the point of this insurance is to make sure that if your bank goes under, if you go one day to your bank and it's all closed up and there's nobody there, like we did see in 2008 during the recession in the U.S., then you are not completely out of your money, that you are protected and that you can recoup some of the money in your bank account. So the Bank of Canada, banker to commercial banks, those chartered banks, Controller of the money supply, all right? So changing the overnight rate and the bank rate to influence how much money is in circulation, printing banknotes, doing quantitative easing. Banker to the federal government, okay? So buying government bonds, the government holding their money at the Bank of Canada. Managing the monetary policy, so stimulating the economy, slowing it down and supporter of the fiduciary monetary system by creating tr trust and faith in the money and in the system, the amount of money in circulation.